to another episode of Standing Eight. I'm Paul Fitzgerald, and I'm joined with three-time world champion and boxing hall of famer Jeff Finney. Great to be here, Paul, as always. And the voice of Australian boxing, Ben Damon. G'day, Paul. Uh, good to be here, mate. So, really special guest today. We've got a uh, 300 gamer in the NRL and a premiership winner as well, Robbie Farrett. Robbie, how are you, mate? The first time I've seen you since you retired without your 247 shirt on. Yeah. <laughs> Anything for a free, free plug, mate. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, 247's kind of um, – yeah, come to a halt at the moment oh, with, is it? with okay. the way the, the way the world's you know, closed up. So yeah. it's kind of affected our business. Yeah, events are a little bit tricky at the moment. It is, and overseas travel, which is predominantly what we do. But yeah, you know, hopefully um, get back on track soon. You know, the world's starting to open back up again, and so looking forward to getting back stuck into to a bit of work with that. How are you enjoying retirement in general? Yeah, I've actually really enjoyed it. To be honest, um, it's been quite a change for me. I think I'm quite fortunate in the fact that um, I've allowed myself to have a bit of time off as well, and. Um, which is something I really haven't done for you know, 20 odd years. Uh, I think about being a professional athlete is um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's such a demanding lifestyle. Um, your whole life revolves around um, you know, being a professional athlete, whether it's your diet, your sleep, um, you know, not being able to travel and you're always on a schedule. So for me, I've really enjoyed uh, the re- relaxed sort of time I've had in the last 12 months, being able to kind of just do what I want when I want to. It's, it's something I'm not really used to, but um, it's something I've really enjoyed. Yeah, and when uh, Robbie talks about being professional, I'm uh, pretty blessed. I've trained lots and lots of footballers over the years and every time Robbie's got something special on them, um, he's always at the house and um, that's probably one of the hardest trainers I've ever been involved with. And, uh, yeah, it's been an honour uh, helping you at certain stages of your career. But, yeah, retirement, how is it? Mate, it's, it's really good. Uh, as I said, I um, I was doing some stuff with the, the business. I was doing a fair bit of travel. So the first, yeah, before COVID, so from September to March, I was kind of jet-setting all around yeah. the world. You know, I went um, went over to the UK for an English Premier League tour and then I played in a, a charity um, in the, uh, the Dubai Sevens over there and then I was kind of down in Melbourne for the Australian Open Tennis and then we took 30-odd clients to the, um, to the Super Bowl in Miami, which was I saw that, which yeah. was a lot of fun as well. So, what a life. Um, yeah, so, yeah, all my mates are like, oh, <laughs> yeah, not, Sammy not, not a bad hate. job. I was like, yeah. hey, don't be hating me because I came up with the idea. So <laughs> I that's, think Sammy that's considered a- work for me. Sammy yeah. Ayub's still there. Yeah, he's, he's in probably, quarantine. He won't we, come we, home. We lost him over there somewhere. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, look, as I said, you know, I was always, you know, during my career I was always, um, you know, quite um, professional and I was really big on preparation and training hard. So, I always made a lot of sacrifices, you know, not drinking, not traveling and doing those things. And yeah, you know, as Jeff said, I was fortunate enough to 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 have been trained by him through my career. And it's something you know, I really enjoyed and really learned a lot from. You know, obviously a legend uh in his own right, you know, um, probably the greatest Australian boxer we've had. So for me to train with him was just an honor and taught me a lot about toughness. And um, you know, I carried that through my career. So um, you know, if now for me to kind of um you know, not not stress about my preparation and things like that and just allow myself to relax and travel and you know if I want to have a drink I can have a drink and if I want to go somewhere I can it's it's uh it's been a bit of a change for me but something I've, I've really enjoyed and uh, to be honest I haven't I haven't missed footy at all which has um been quite pleasing you know I think um I was quite content when I retired retired and I got to retire on my own terms so you know I, I never look back with any regrets or you know wishing that I was still playing one of your great friends and teammates is in a Bit of a position at the moment, Benji Marshall. Yeah. Um, should he retire? Should he hang the boots up, Rob? Or should he just? Um, he thinks that he can go another year. What do you think? Yeah. Look, that that's a question. Yeah, you know, he has to answer it for himself. You know, I um I knew the time was right right for me, and um, you know, I was I was really um. Oh, look, everyone would love to play forever, you know, and I still think I I could play if I wanted to. You know, physically, I I still train and um I still like to compete, and I think I I still could play, but. You know, for me, well, I sat down and I had to weigh up a few things. Um, you know, obviously, um, your body and, um, you know, the team we had at the Tigers, obviously, like, when, when you get to that stage in your career, you still got to have the drive every day to improve, go in and get better and, and still want to get better and, and compete. And um, and and when you get – I wasn't playing rep footy anymore, so I obviously finished up playing Origin, finished up playing for Australia, so – as, as bad as bad as it is to say, the only reason he plays to win a grand final. And, and when I looked at it, I was like, am I going to win a comp in the next couple of years at the Tigers? We were kind of in that phase there where it was going to take a few years to get back on top. Um, and then you weigh up the financial aspect of it. You know, is it worth it? Is it worth putting my body through, you know, more injuries, and more, yeah. more risk? And for me, it was just like, you know what, I've got nothing left to prove. Um, I've done everything I wanted to. It's time for me to walk away. So... 
Yeah, for Benji, I think yeah, he's got to sit down and ask himself all those questions. Um, if he's still got the desire to play, then um, well, then you're a long time retired, so you play for as long as you can. But look, I I, I personally would have liked to have seen him finish up at the Tigers. I think um, yeah, Benji is the Tigers. When you think of, yeah, of the course. West Tigers, you think Benji Marshall. So for me, yeah. I'd love to see him finish up having played his last game at the Tigers. It, it'd be a bit weird seeing him play for another club, but um, it looks like he's still keen to play play again. So it'd be interesting to see how that works out. Yeah, definitely. Robbie, you had you basically achieved everything in rugby league. You played for Australia, you played for Lebanon, New South Wales, City. Um, when you look back on your career, what are some of your fondest memories? Oh, so, so many, to be honest. Um, yeah, g- growing up, it was just a, a, a dream to play one NRL game. You know, I never came from a rugby league family. Uh, my brothers laughed at me when I said I wanted to play NRL, uh, but I was just a real stubborn kid and especially like, my brothers, I, I was always like, yeah, if you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to prove you wrong. So uh, to play one in a row, I still remember my debut at Leichhardt Oval like it was yesterday, um, yeah. Yeah, how much it meant to me just to to call myself an NRL player. But then, you know, to, to go on and, um, you know, first of all, captain my club, the Tigers, um, was a you know, massive honour for me and, and do that for so long. Um, then to go and play State of Origin, you know, I remember as a kid watching State of Origin on a, on a Wednesday night or, you know, when the team announcement come out, you'd be around the radio in the morning because you know there was no internet back then. You used to have to listen for the mm-hmm. you know the for the radio for um for the team the announcement, team. and you'd be yeah. so excited. And then all of a sudden, I find myself running out in front of eighty thousand people at ANZ Stadium. Um, was just almost surreal, you know. I just yeah. didn't, I didn't think a kid like myself could ever do that and play for Australia, and then. Um, Obviously, win a grand final at the Tigers at, at the age of twenty one. With your teammates, is that the biggest thing? Oh yeah, we're, we're catching up next month. It's it's fifteen year anniversary actually, oh, two thousand five. Wow. And I was just saying, I was talking to a friend yesterday, and um, when you share that sort of experience with a bunch of mates, you, you have a special bond forever. Yeah. And you might not see each other for four or five years, or you know, it's guys are you know got their own lives and they move like some of some of the boys are up in Queensland or in New Zealand, but then. Every time you catch up, it's just like you saw each other yeah, yesterday. Yeah. You know, it's like you're yeah. the best of mates because you've just shared in something so special and yeah. you have that bond forever and that connection. Especially but, a run like that, which would have meant so much to that club and to both the clubs that had formed the West Tigers as well. It was such a special premiership. Well, it, it was, you know, because everyone was still uncertain about the merger yeah. and uh, is it going to work and there was so much infighting going on between Balmain and West, but then that year it all <laughs> kind of came together and I think – we were kind of almost everyone's second favourite team and we yeah. played this brand of footy that was so exciting, you know, and it kind of inspired a, a whole generation of kids where, yeah, every kid was in the backyard doing the Benji Marshall step. Well, Benji was on Benji fire Marshall that season. And, yeah, yeah, yeah pretty pass in the Hodjo and, and, yeah. and you know what's sad because when I'm just sitting here thinking we've had Benny Elias, I was with Block on the guys and – they weren't a part of it, so it's really – it's for me it's strange when you think of Balmain, you think of mm. Rochi and Benny yeah, and all those yeah, guys, yeah. and they weren't, they weren't even a part <laughs> but, of that. You know, but and this that was victory, so great. Uh, yeah. well, that premiership yeah, would have meant so much to all of that. Well, they were around, yeah, yeah. around us. I still remember Timmy Brasher come down to training that week and you know, after we won, the you know, you know Blocker and, and Ciro and that were in the sheds afterwards. I think Hino tipped the beer on Ciro's head about <laughs> an hour after an hour after full time and um, so we always laugh about that. But, look, uh, you know – yeah, they they shared in it, and you can you can tell how happy they were for us. Even like they missed out in eighty eight yeah, and eighty nine, you know. Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure that you know lingers on and hurts for them even yeah. to this day. But yeah, uh, for them to see yeah the club you know, get you know get to the premiership like we did, um, and then play some um, small part of it, I think that made them really proud. Um, we had Benny on this show, um, and yeah, it clearly still hurts, particularly yeah. eighty nine. Um, being a young Lebanese kid playing hooker for the Tigers, uh, there's a lot of similarities there. Did you did you look back on Benji's path on um, Benny. Benny's path uh, when when you were coming through? No, not really. I think you know Benny probably retired. I was I was still a young kid, so I yeah. don't really remember much of his career. But I think obviously from a young age, everyone always compared me to him, being, yeah, being Lebanese and and being a hooker and and playing for Balmain, or I was a Balmain junior, so. There was always those comparisons coming through, and um, yeah, he had that sort of attacking sort of flair where he almost changed the way you know, hookers were perceived yeah, back was, then. Yeah. And, and then I, I kind of had that attacking ability. I For was, sure. yeah. I was almost like a, I was a halfback when I was younger, and then kind of converted to hookers. Mm. So I still had that, um, yeah, sort of halfback ment- mentality playing out a dummy half. And 
So there was always, yeah, those comparisons between me and Benny. Yeah, but this comparison, do you have as many bloody houses as him? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe <Bad> not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Robbie, I've heard you um, tell the story before, actually, to Sporting News Australia, our friend Brendan Bradford, um, about your debut. Um, Tim Sheen's giving you the call up yeah. and having to change your boots. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I didn't think I was going to play. You know, he called me into the office on um on the Friday, and because I was I was off I was off contract, and they wanted to get me re-signed, and um, so we got that all sorted on the Friday. You know, agreed to a contract, and then you know, on the Saturday morning, he called me in to captain's run at Leichhardt, and um, and then Robbie Mears, who was on the bench at the time, he uh, yeah he had an injury cloud under him, and then Sheensy called me in, and I di- I didn't think much of it to be honest. Um, you know, I thought it was more contract talk, and um, then he said, "Mate, I'm, I'm thinking about playing you tomorrow, but you can't wear those white boots." That was the first thing he said to me. <laughs> I said, "Mate, I'll wear whatever you bloody want me to. I don't <laughs> care." So, <laughs> and at the time, I was a young kid. I didn't have a boot sponsor, or you know, I couldn't get a new pair of boots you know, straight away. So, I, I, I literally went home and coloured them in in a black texter. <laughs> so, I you know, got a black texter, coloured in my white boot. Because back then, you know, no, no one used to wear white boots. You know, I was I was yeah. a bit of a, a Larry kid, you know, pretty confident and. I had these flashy white boots and you know what I, happened when Changle wore the white boots, mate. Yeah, I know. Well, he said because we were playing Manly that day and they had Solomon Hamono in, in their team and I think Terry Hill and a few other guys and yeah, Sheensy said, mate, if they see this young kid run on the field in these white boots, I'll take your head off. So, yeah. uh, so mate, I went home and colour them in, colour them in, in the black <laughs> text. So yeah, it's a pretty funny story. Oh, funny. You've played with a lot of different coaches over your over your career. Is there one particular coach in that sort of stands out that you know taught you a few different things? Yeah, look, they're they're all different in their in their own right. To be honest, um, they all have their their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, obviously, I came through under Tim Sheens and played un, played over ten years for Sheensy, and um, he taught he taught me so much. I think if if any of you guys have met Sheensy, I'm sure you probably met him back in the day. You've never met a smarter footy brain. Like he's just always thinking about football. He's always thinking about little trick moves and you know ways to beat the opposition. Like we we had a game plan, a different game plan every week depending on who we were playing. He was just so smart in breaking down a game of, of rugby league and, yeah, he taught me so much. And um, the, the thing about Sheensy was, yeah, he, he played such a massive role in us winning the grand final in 2005 because he understood the players that he had. Um, yeah, we were a bunch of, yeah, ki- like it was kids and a lot of exper- a lot older experienced guys that came together and, like, he understood that we weren't going to win games, you know, 14-10 or, yeah, 8-6 with our defence. Yeah, you know, he he knew that we had points in us, and he said, "All right, well, if the opposition is going to score thirty points, we'll score thirty-two. And that was the way. Yeah, you know, he he adapted to the roster that he had, which was the smartest thing to do because you weren't going to try and make Benji Marshall play structured football or myself or Princey. Mm-hmm. So he he realized what he had, and and he adapted the game plan around that. Um, and the other thing he said, he gave us the confidence and he said, look, he goes, I don't care what you try on the footy field. He goes, if you practice it at training, you can do whatever you want. So whilst everyone watching us on TV thought, Geez, these guys are just throwing the ball around and doing what they want, every single thing we did was, was practice, whether it was a chip and chase, yeah, we'd do it at training. You know, Benji's flick pass, he'd do it every second day at training. So we expected it on the footy field and we and we understood each other's games. Like if Benji had the ball, you're just like, you ready for anything? Expect anything. Just yeah. follow it. Yeah, just yeah. expect anything. Whereas Princey or Hodjo or myself, like we practiced everything. And you know, Sheensy, Sheensy was so, so smart, you know, in the way he, he went about that. And um, you know, Royce Simmons was his assistant coach. And you know, he, prob- he probably had the biggest influence on my career, probably out of any coach, because he was an ex-hooker. And he taught me not, not just about footy, but about what it took to be an NRL player day in, day out, week in, week out. He taught me so much about toughness and preparation um, yeah, he taught me about, you know, taking myself to that uncomfortable, you know, being, he always used to say to me, you know, learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable because mm. that's what being an athlete is. 100%. You know, you got to take yourself to that dark place during a game or during training. You've got to do things that you don't want to do. You know, you, your mind's telling you I'm tired or, you know, I don't want to make that tackle or I'm not going to chase that ball, but it's you got to get comfortable going to that place and, yeah. and you got to do it consistently. The good players do it week in, week out and, and, it's a habit. You don't just you don't just all of a sudden click your fingers and, and learn to become that person. It's it's something that you, a habit you form day in day out. It's called your preparation. Life. Yeah, you prepare for this. You know, and and Royce taught me so much. You know about that and um, being an ex hooker, I I you know, hung off every word that he said and he almost took me under his wing and I used to do so many one on one sessions because my defense as a young kid wasn't 
uh, the, the strength of my game was always probably perceived to be a weakness. And I used to work with him day in, day out on my defence and my, my kicking game and, and little you know, the little crafty areas of being a hooker. So, you know, he, he's had the biggest influence on my career. And then, you know, origin level, um, I had Craig Bellamy when I debuted. I, I played two games before I got dropped. I didn't really, um, yeah, I wasn't really with him for an extended period of time um, yeah. to, to kind of – um, get a feel for, get a feel yeah. for yeah, his style. Uh, but then obviously when I came back, you know, yeah, Sticky picked me again. And, and Sticky's um, he's someone I absolutely love to death. Yeah. You know, Sticky's the type of coach where he doesn't have to say much, but he'll come up to you before kickoff and he'll just look at you and go, yeah, I fucking love you, mate. Like, yeah, I'm depending on there, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he's just that type of bloke where. That passion. You just, you just, I don't want to let this bloke down. Like, I'll run through a brick, a brick wall for this bloke. Like, yeah. just, and it, it wasn't about game plan or, or whatever. It was just, just passion and. Yeah, and it's funny because when when um, when I was younger coming through and uh, you know, Sheenzy obviously coached at the Raiders with you know, the side he had in the 90s and Sheenzy always used to say to me, he said, mate, he goes, you and Ricky are cut from the same cloth. He goes, you remind yeah. me so much. Like we're obviously very passionate, very hot-headed sort of characters and a bit fiery and things like that. And Sheenzy used to say that I'd remind him of Sticky. And then when I met Sticky and he was my coach, we just had this instant connection from day one. You know, we had this both you know, winners, I mate. Both down. passionate. Yeah. Yeah. And then mm. and then Loz. Loz is, you know, I love playing under Loz in origin as well. You know, Loz is the type of person where he doesn't say much, but you know, when he does, you you just yeah, respect is, what he says yeah. because he's just a great at the game, you know, and he yeah. understands origin. So I love being under under Loz, um, you know, in origin as well. And then then there was a bit of a uh Coaching roller coaster there, you know, merry go round at the Tigers. Or you know, Mick Potter came and, and went, and then obviously the uh, the infamous time under Jason Taylor, and then um, and then I went to to Souths under Madge. You know, Madge, um, he's someone I really respect because I've never seen you know, Madge's strength is that uh, I've never seen someone care about his players so much. You know, individually, Madge cares about you as a person, yeah, you know, not just a football. He really genuinely cares about a person and wants the best for you and. Um, should, should think about it. I've been through some coaches, haven't I? Then, <laughs> yeah. came, then, then yeah. Madge left. Madge left South, and I had uh, Anthony Seabold, and yeah, you know, I, I really respect Anthony Seabold because yeah, he was honest with me from day one. And, and as an athlete, all you ask for is 100%. is honesty, you know. And I came back from the World Cup in seventeen, and I'd kind of had a you know a bit of a topsy turvy year at South, where yeah, you know, it was me and Damian Cook playing half a game each, and yeah, you know, we none of us really kind of. We're getting a feel for the game. And then day one of training, I went for a coffee with with Siebes and, and um, he sat me down. He said, look, I want to play one hooker this year, an 80-minute hooker. He goes, and and Cookie's going to get first crack. And, I, mate, I respected that. And I said, mate, thanks for letting me know where I stand. You know, I'd rather that than you, um, you know, pissing in my pocket and, uh, you know, telling me, you know, otherwise. And I knew where I stood and um, and I went about my business. And I said, all right, well, you know, that's the way it is and, I'll keep showing up the training and do what I have to do and be ready if an opportunity comes. And and credit to Sieb, you know, he said to me, look, I don't see you as a reserve grade hooker. You don't have to play reserve grade every week. And if an opportunity comes your way, like I'll let you go because, you know, you don't deserve to, to be sitting here playing reserve grade. And then luckily enough, Tigers came knocking halfway through the year and I ended up back at the Tigers and Sieb was, was a man of his word. And he probably didn't have to let me go because I was almost South's insurance policy that year because yeah. – at the time, they were first in the comp, won about 10 in a row. Yeah. And Damien Cook, if something had happened to him and he got injured, you know, and I wasn't there, Yeah, they were stuffed. They, yeah. they had no one else, you know. So, But he said, mate, I gave you my word you can go. You know, you, I'll let you go back to the Tigers. I know uh, that's your home. And so I went back to the Tigers and played under Ivan. And I really liked Ivan because he was the most chilled coach I've ever had. Like he doesn't – he just – He looks pretty chilled. Yeah, he's just so chilled, you know. And I love that kind of – I'd been through so many sort of intense coaches where back end of my career I, I'd become a bit more chilled. So yeah, I yeah, liked that he was more chilled, you know, and then obviously he moved on and then funnily enough Madge came came over from South. So yeah, a bloody few coaches there. It took a while to get through. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just you touched on it briefly there, but the Jason Taylor period, you'd, pay, you'd played, what, 247 games for the Tigers before that relationship soured it to the point well, I ended you, on 247 games. Yeah, yeah that yeah. was when it finally came to an end. And then you came end. back. But mm. um, what happened in that period with JT? What, what, oh, was, the, what was the issue? Shit, what can I say? Because it, it, it's interesting because you played Origin that year. You played yeah, the three yeah, Origin games origin. and you got 
yeah. dropped to New South Wales Cup. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and then bizarre. Uh, yeah, and then uh, uh, Loz picked me from from New South Wales Cup, so which was um, you know a great sign of respect from a man like Laurie Daly, and you know, and I, and I always say, I say, like, I'd, 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 how do I say this? You know, I, you know, I, I respect Laurie Daly's opinion more than Jason Taylor's. So if he's going to pick me from, you know, or, uh, reserve grade, that that says a lot, you know, about because because self doubt starts to creep in. You know, like as an athlete, you're like, what am I doing wrong? You know, I, I couldn't see what he was seeing, you know, at the time, and so self doubt. You know, maybe I am going shit. Maybe I am, you know, not good enough to play first grade. But then I thought, hang on a sec. The origin coach still wants to pick me. So, and the origin coach is Laurie Daly, who's one of the legends of our yeah, game. So, sure. I must be going all right. So, you know, um, and I thought, you know, I respect his opinion more than this guy. So, it, it was just a, it was a weird relationship from day one. Um, it, it didn't start well. Um, I'll tell you a story. I don't know if many people know. Um, I don't know if I'll get in trouble, but I really don't care anymore. No but, one um, listens, mate. Don't worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> but um, no, look, look, from that from day one, he got the job and. Um, I got picked to play for Australia um, at the end of the Four Nations, the Four Nations at the end of the year, which you know, when you play for Australia, you go on tour and then you get your six weeks break. You don't come back until the new year, whereas pre-season for the rest of the side starts, you know, 1st of November. Yeah. So I got picked to play for Australia. Jason Taylor just got the job and, he, and then he called me and said, mate, I don't want you to play for Australia. He said, I want you to be here from day one of pre-season. It's a big pre-season for us. Yeah, I, want, I don't want you to play. So I was like, all right, well, what do I do? Wasn't sure. I was like, new coaches here. I don't want to piss him off. Yeah. Do I do what he says, not play? But at the same time, I was 30 years old, 31. I thought I'm never going to get picked again. Fuck, you're playing for Australia. Playing for Australia. Yeah. So I rang a few. I rang my manager. I rang Phil Gould, who, you know, I, um, I get along with really well and obviously I respect his opinion a lot. Of course. I rang a few people. And, mate, Phil Gould said to me, he said, mate, tell the bloke to F off. He goes... You, playing, off, you play the game to play, huh? What's here for? Fuck off. Oh, right. <laughs> he goes, tell about the fuck off. He goes, he goes you, you're playing for your country. This is why you play the game. Yeah, he goes, you never turn that opportunity down. Never. Yeah. yeah. And I spoke to a few people and I thought, you know what? Yeah, you know, they're right. You know, I want to play for my country. This is going to be the last opportunity to play yeah, for my country. Yeah, pretend I'm Jason Taylor and ring me up. <laughs> no, I, I, I rang him up and I said, mate, I've had a think I about can't. it. I want to play for my country. Um, like, I respect that you don't want me to play, but I've made the decision I'm going to play. And he just said to me, he said, mate, you're selfish. Mm. And I said, mate, I said, how the fuck can you call me selfish? I said, I said, you're thinking as a coach, right? You don't want me to play. I said, but put yourself in my shoes. I said, if you were a player, would you turn down the opportunity to play for Australia? Yeah. You know, and then just from there, it just kind of, you know, I, I played for Australia and then came back and then, you know, I just went downhill and I, I could sense like, you know, sense things like he'd nitpick at my game. Every day we'd win by twenty or thirty points, but he's like, oh, "You did this wrong, you did that wrong," and to a point where I started getting paranoid. And I grabbed my leadership group and I said, "Boys, are you seeing the things that he's seeing?" Like, you know, mm. um, and they're like, "No, nah, you know, we're not," and whatever. And um, yeah, then it just stopped talking to me, and um, you know, and it, it was weird because, and then he, and I said, uh, I said to him at the time. I said, mate, I went up to it because like, he called me in his office and he had all these dramas going on and whatever. And he said, I said, mate, I said, I'm the least of your worries because down down in the um, like the playing, some of the younger boys and yeah, you know, guys, I'm probably not at the club anymore. You probably guess who, but you know, they were just like going, oh, this bloke and just you know, mm. we don't like this guy. But I said, boys, I said, we've just like Mick Potter's just gone. Mm. All right, like I don't like. Just shut your mouths. He's our coach. Just just can play for the coach. You know what I mean? Like, we don't need this fucking bullshit. So I was down there fueling fires. He's up there thinking I'm the problem. Yeah. I said, mate, you're barking up the wrong tree if you think I'm the problem. I said, and uh, he was getting told by all the other coaching staff as well. He said, mate, Robbie's the least of your problems. Yeah. But he just had it in. He was just like, Easy and I don't know. I don't know whether he was like intimidated by me or the fact that I'd been at the club for, you know, 15 years and um, he didn't like that. I'm not sure what it was and. The relationship just deteriorated and, um, yeah, tried to let me go at the end of 15. Um, and I said, no, I'm not going. So I'm not going and um, showed up for pre-season. I had a few clubs at the time. And I said, I'm not going unless it's on my terms. Uh, there were a few clubs. I was, I think, Dragons and Newcastle. They were going through a rebuilding phase and I thought, you know, I'm not going to go to a, another club that's in a rebuilding phase. If I'm going to go somewhere, it's it's got to be a step up. You know, I want to go try win a comp. Um, and then... 
it was, it was, I think it was publicised at the time. I met with the Roosters, um, agreed to terms with the Roosters. I was, I was going to go there. And then by that time, Dustin Pascoe had come in as CEO of the Tigers. And he just said, no, I'm not letting you go. I said, mate, you've you got to let me go. Well, the coach doesn't want me here. He said, no, not letting you go. Uh, made me stay. So ended up staying for uh, the next season. And then same thing the, the next season, you know, it just it went downhill and dropped me mm. to reserve grade. And then um, yeah, ended up signing for the for the Rabbitohs, and, and it, which was ridiculous, like the amount of money they paid me to go. I, I was just sitting there. I was... I still remember I was at the airport. I was season finished. I was flying to Uluru with my mate, and we're at the airport. And, I, and Sammy Ayu came and said, "Mate, you got to sign your release, your release form." Um, so he met me. I was I was in the Virgin Lounge at domestic airport in in, uh, in Sydney. Yeah, I was with my mate, and my mate's a massive like diehard Tigers fan. And Sammy came with this release <laughs> form, and I had to sign it. And my mate had to witness it. And my mate just looked at it, and he just couldn't believe like the figures the numbers the numbers like you, you think i'd you think i was a criminal like the way they were getting rid of me and like, paying me that much to go like <laughs> no seriously like I, I couldn't comprehend i was like you're paying me this much money to go to another club it was ridiculous and then three weeks into the new year he gets sacked and my phone was going off i was at south trade my phone was everyone like you must be so happy like he's gone he's gone he's gone but i felt sick I felt sick yeah. because I thought, yeah. why the fuck did I go through what I went through yeah. for you to go and sack him three weeks later? Yeah. Like it just didn't make sense. Mm. It didn't make sense, you know, and it just left so many unanswered questions. And um, But anyway, I, I, I came back to the club and I, I was fortunate enough to, to finish my career the way I did. And I always say, look, if, if, you're, if you're a bad person, you know, you don't last long in the game and – Where's he, to be honest? So um, I haven't spoken to the bloke. I don't like the bloke. Um, probably never speak to the bloke. And you know, he got what he deserved and I got what I deserved and I finished my career at the club the way um, it probably should have been in the first place. So yeah. everything kind of ended well, but it was a it was a really difficult time in my life, like really difficult, like mentally and everything because I had everything taken away from me. And I, I gave up the captaincy at the Tigers End up having to leave. I was playing reserve grade. Um, went to, you know, left the club, and yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a really difficult time. And and I would have had a chip on my shoulder for the rest of my life, to be honest, if I didn't come back and finish my career the way I did at the club. Yeah. Do you think the fact that he got sacked by the Tigers um, <laughs> impacted the way you uh, performed at Souths? That you sort of didn't become part of the furniture there, and you never felt that you belonged at the club. You always felt that you should have been back at the Tigers. If, if he if he'd st still been there, do you think it would have given you something to sort of work against? No, it had nothing to do with that. I, I just never felt, as you said, like I never felt a part of the fabric at, at South. Like, right. you know, I look back now and like it never worked out for me on the field at, at the Bunnies. I never played my best footy. Um, and that was mostly my fault. One, because I held that resentment from what had happened to me. And mentally, as I said, mentally, it was really tough what I, what I went through. Like there were some really dark days and I had to speak to people and, you know, had to lean on a lot of, close friends and family around me uh, because I do wear my heart on my sleeve and uh, and yeah, all those things kind of over what happened to me kind of overwhelm me, you know, and then going to Souths, it just didn't feel like my home. Um, whilst the, the club were were outstanding, you know, they, they really took me in and um, I can't speak highly enough of their organisation. You can tell why they've been so successful so, for a long time, so many good people at that club. Um it just never felt like my home. I, I'd, I'd even rock up to training at Redfern Oval and obviously Redfern Oval is a public uh, park and the yeah. cafe and the people outside and people would see me and they're like, oh, Robbie from the Tigers. <laughs> now, even though I was a <laughs> South player, says. I was still Robbie from the Tigers. That's how they saw me and that's how I saw myself. Yeah. <laughs> and you always will be Robbie from <laughs> the Tigers. But that's the way yeah. it was, you know, 100%. and I never felt like – and I'm the, I'm the type of person, like I, I, gave, I gave my all for the Tigers – day in, day out, week in, week out, because I had that emotional attachment, that mm -hmm. connection, that genuine <clears throat> care, you know, like I'd give everything for that jersey and I probably never replicated that at the Bunnies and it never, I never played my best footy because of it, you know, and then it was no coincidence that when I went back to the Tigers, I was two years older, but then all of a sudden I was back to playing my best footy again and I still think even in my last season I was playing as good a footy as I'd played throughout my career, you know, it was, because I've always been that type of person. If I care about something so much, if I've got that emotional attachment, you know, 
it's going to bring out the best in me. It's going to bring out the best in me. And uh, as bad as as it is to say, that probably never happened at at the Bunnies. Who's the best player you played with the Tigers? Uh, Again, it's it's hard to single out one because they're all my mates, but Mm -hmm. they're all there's so many good players in their own right. No, obviously, Benji is. So some of the stuff he's done on a football field, I think no one else has done or can do and probably will never be seen again. Some of the plays he's come up with, um, but just the aura he has and, um, you know, how that gives confidence to the players around him. Um, and the combination I formed with Benji from a very young age brought the best out of me. Like we were just on the same wavelength from from the first time we trained together. You know, we, we had that, that football smarts. You know, he knew sometimes I wouldn't even have to call something. You know, he just knew what I was going to do and I knew what he was going to do and we'd just be there and we formed this combination that um, brought out the best in, in me and I'd like to think uh, I brought out the best yeah, in course. him as well, you know. Yeah. Um, so for me, he was a massive part of my career and definitely, you know, the best or one of the best I played with. But then, I, but then I look at guys like like Gareth Ellis came over from England. He's yeah. one of the toughest guys I played with all around, all around like skillful, tough, just had every – thing you'd want in a mm-hmm. in a football player. You know, guys like Brett Hodgson who you look at him, he's yeah. like 70 kilos ring and wet, mm-hmm. but we just get bashed every week, but yeah. then just get back up again. Yeah. And probably the, the silkiest footy player I played with, um, you know, Liam Fulton, who Liam Fulton never got the raps as a footy player who's, again, he couldn't even bench 60 kilos in the gym, but you put him on the footy field and he'd be first player back there taking play two carries or on a kick chase or – yeah, if he was ten kilos heavier, he'd play for Australia and and yeah. um, and New South Wales. You know, um, so so many so many guys. It's hard to to pinpoint one um, that I played with at the Tigers. So and, and then rep rep was the same. You know, same like like in a, in a similar when I when I look at Benji Marshall, the player that reminds me of Benji Marshall is Jared Hayne. Like Jared Hayne on his day is unplayable. Yeah, you could not stop him. Like that 2014 Origin series, he was just mm-hmm. and, and the. You know, 2009 run that he had, like, oh, on, on his day, he's, you know, the best I've played with as well, you know. So, so so many good players. How'd you go with um, Benji? You, obviously, you were both <coughs> um, so important to each other, but you played yeah. together for a long time, two big personalities and two dominant players on the field. Um, did you clash mm. through p- stages? Was it difficult having those two, you know, massive um, players on the field at, at all times? Yeah, look, not really. I know, like, during our career there was always a report. There's always rumours. Yeah, there's always, always rumours. But, you know, the only time we'd, we'd clash because of, like, yeah, care care for our team and yeah. care for each other, passion. you know, yeah. passion. And, like, when don't you have a run in at training and, like, yeah, like get up each other yeah. and whatever and you want each other to yeah. improve, but that's what mates do. Yeah. You know, if you can't be honest with your mates. Well, not just mates, it's that all out winning. 100%. You just 100% want to win. You want, yeah, the, best, yeah, yeah, you want yeah, the best yeah. out of each other. It was never yeah. like, oh, oh I if and hate you or we come to a brawl. So none or, of that stuff was true. Nah, none of it was true. Yeah, you know? right. None of it at all was true. And um, it was just funny. Like it always came up after we'd lost a few games. And was, I think it was because we were such big personalities. Mm. And, um, you know, I guess it was a bit of an easy target at times. And um, so it always seemed to come up year in. Year out when when we'd lost a few so did games, you but laugh about it or was it talked about at training? Yeah, 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 yeah. We we talk about it and we we'd laugh, but then it started getting annoying too. <laughs> yeah, it did. It started to get annoying to give us the shits. And I think one year I went on the Matty John show and he brought it up and I fired back at Matty because I was just it gets to the point where you just you're sick of it, you know, like you 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 just get over it. But um, like yeah, we clash, but I I clash I clash with most players to be honest because <laughs> boy, the boys the boys would tell you like I was just you know, I was. I was always about – I was a bit of old school. I came up in that generation where it was tough love, you know. Yeah. So it was always like, you know, rip someone if, yeah, they've done something wrong or they made a mistake. And I think now with the new generation, sometimes that, they probably don't handle that as well. And sometimes instead of ripping someone, you've got to go to put your armour up. Oh, mm-hmm. It's going to be all right, mate, you know. And so, yeah. so a lot of guys didn't like um, sometimes my delivery of things, but that was me, you know. And I, my, my opinion was, look, we're playing – NRL rugby league, like if you can't cop a spray, yeah, and it wasn't if as you if you done it to one person, no. you done it to the whole team. Whoever, whoever, and, 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 it was never per- and it was never personal. No, it was no. always because, yeah, of course. hey, I want us to get better. I want us to win. If you can't cop a spray, then you're in the wrong sport. You know, well, what, you had, what are you doing here? You so, had, a, you, you really had a love hate relationship with the media during that period. Do you think that's, yeah, they that's loved, why? Oh, because I hated them. <laughs> <laughs> Is it because you're so um, brutally honest? Yeah, I just don't cop shit. You know, a lot of them. 
yeah, they, they make up stuff and they, they're just two-faced. They, you know, they'll, they'll write something bad about you, but then next time they see like, oh, hey, mate, how are you? I'm like, fuck off, mate. I'm not shaking your hand. Like, don't think you can talk shit about me, but then come up and be nice to my face. Like, I'm the yeah. type of person that, you know, if I don't like you, I'll tell you to your face I don't like you, but don't go talk about me or write an article that's complete nonsense. But then when you see me, come out, come out and, uh, you know, pretend like you love me and you're my best mate. Like, yeah. I'm not going to put up with that shit. So, yeah, that was that was just me, you know. I called a spade a spade, and now you've got to work with a lot of them, though, don't you? Yeah, different look, things that you do. No, look, a lot, a lot of them. I've a lot of them. I've spoken to since, and um, and I've told them. I've told them why I don't like them, or if, if they don't, and, and they get it, and I think they respect me for it too, because, uh, as I said, like you know, I, you'd rather hear it to your face than, yeah. you know, a lot of them know why they upset me, or you know, look, and, and if I if I'd done something wrong and they write an article. Sweet, like I'll cop it on the chin because it's my doing. Like I, I, I stuffed up, you know. So, yeah. But when you're making up stuff or whatever, like, and a lot of them would would ring me and, oh, is this is this true? I say no, it's not true. And they're like, oh, we're going to write it anyway. I'm like, why'd you ask me if it's true? And, you know? and then they go and write it, and I'm like, you're an idiot. Like, yeah. Oh, how do you want me to talk to you, respect you when, you know, you go and run this bullshit story that affects me, affects my family. Yeah. Like it's complete nonsense. Yeah. You know, and and I just. Yeah, that's just not the way I, I deal. So and then deal with things, and so a lot of them they knew I didn't like them, and um, so I had a. It was funny. We used to laugh about it training, especially like Liam, Liam Fulton. Like he's a funny. He's like, oh, the journal would have media days. Like, oh, who's on your blacklist? Say, so who's who's the ones that you don't talk to? I was like, yeah, that guy, that guy, that guy. <laughs> so all the boys knew the ones I I talked to and didn't talk to. It was it was quite funny, but it, it caused me it caused me um because you, you got to play the game. Yeah, you know, you've been in media too, yeah. like. A lot of them like play the game and keep them on side, you know, and so they don't write anything bad about them and that. But yeah. guys probably wrote bad things about me because they knew I didn't like them and I told them I didn't like them, so they just kept hammering me and hammering me. But oh, well, I'd rather be like that than good on you, Rob. Yeah, no, yeah. it's too full on that rugby league ground. I, I it wasn't oh, for there's me. so many agendas going on. It's, yeah, it's ridiculous. No, yeah, boxing's a lot easier. Just do whatever yeah. you want. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. make it up. Yeah. Um, let's get Robbie Matriski <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Pete, uh, um, he, he's done well. Um, Robbie, your final game was a well, it was a fairy tale, really. And it's funny to say that because you got you got beaten and yeah. you didn't play much time. But um, the way that it it, it happened is yeah. quite incredible. Well, I said afterwards, I said it's like a movie with just with a shit ending, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> which you're not in for very often. That's what, that's what it was, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, absolutely crazy, crazy week. You know, I look back and just the way it unfolded was was unbelievable. And when it happened. I thought this is meant to be, you know, this is, this is like a fairy tale, mm. you know, and I thought I'm going to go out there, win us a game. And, um, but unfortunately, you know, I T- tell us the sat whole story. On the bench. Yeah. You had a yeah, well, broken I, I, leg. I, I broke my leg. Yeah. I obviously announced my retirement and then I broke my leg the week after and, um, got told that I'd be out for 12 weeks. Um, and being as stubborn as I am, I said, no, nah, well, you know, I'll, I'll do everything I can to prove you wrong. So I literally was up every night till four o'clock in the morning, just icing my leg. I was taking, you know, um, bone broths and like just doing every, everything I could. I don't know what was working and what wasn't because I was <laughs> bone broths. Oh, I just, you went all Pete Evans on it. Yeah, I just yeah, right. like anything because you hear like anything to stimulate yeah. bone yeah, healing. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd fractured my knee. Yeah, uh, and it was a depression fracture, so it was uh, it was a weight bearing fracture. So any time I put weight on it, so I was literally just laid up, no no weight on my leg. You know, for the first two or three weeks, uh, as I said, I was taking all these different. You know, supplements and vitamins and uh, all these different machines I was trying on my leg and icing and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to give myself every chance possible. I'm going to retire. I'm going to retire knowing I've done everything I could. Mm-hmm. And then the week of the last game, uh, our physio said, look, wait till Friday to try and run on it and we'll see how you go. And um, I spoke to the surgeon and he said, look, he said, um, I don't recommend it. Yeah. He said, look, you, you, if you're going to play um, – he goes, you're going to do more damage. It's going to be long-lasting damage. You might need an operation if if the fracture becomes displaced. He said, and and he goes, he goes, choose your game wisely because if we'd won that day, we would have made the semis. But he said, he goes, if you play a game, he said, you won't be playing the week after. He said, so pick your game. He goes, you've got one shot at it, pick your game. Because I don't recommend it. He goes, but if you're willing to take the risk, that's up to you. So our physio said, wait till the Friday or Saturday, give it as much time as we can, yeah. and then we'll run you and see what you like. And I said, no, 
I said, I'm running on the Monday. I said, if I can't run on the Monday, I'm not going to mess around with the team. The team needs to know whether I'm going to play or not. I don't want it to be all week, oh, is Robbie in, is Robbie out, whatever. So on the Monday, the boys had a day off. I went into Concord on my own with the physio and he tried to put me through some light drills and I said, no, nah. I said, mate, I'm going full bore. And I literally just changed the direction, ran up off the ground and he just couldn't believe it. He's like, mate, I, I can't believe you just did that. Like it was like he, he was blown away. Yeah. And he said, how do you feel? I said, mate, I said, I, I feel all right, you know, like it's funny the power of the mind, eh? Like when you just put your mind to just something, you just it block out. it out, you know. And I, I trained, he said, let's see how you are tomorrow. Woke up the next morning, I felt good. I was like, mate, I can't believe it. Trained with the team, did everything. And he was like, he goes, mate, I can't believe it. Like, you know, and, and I had a scan. I still had I had a scan early in that week. It was still fractured. And then spoke with Madge on the, he called me the Tuesday afternoon. He said, look, it's too big a risk. I can't play uh yeah, we've got to win. If I lose you after 10 minutes, you know, we're going to be down a player. I can't risk it. He goes, look, I don't want to just make the semis. We want to win next week when we make the semis. He goes, I'm confident the boys can win this week. Let's wait till next week. And I was obviously disappointed because I was like, there might not be a next yeah. week. You know, I want to play. Yeah. Otherwise, my career's over. If we lose, you know, this is this is a semifinal anyway. And I was like, I'm happy to sacrifice myself. I don't care about, like, if, if I can help us get to the semifinals, we hadn't played semifinals in nine years, you know. So I was like, I'll just, I'm happy. I don't care if I don't play next week. Let's yeah. just win this week. But he decided against it and said, no, nope, too much of a risk. And so I respected his decision. I said, all right. So the team knew. You know, we, we played the, the game in the media. Uh, he kept me as a part of the 19-man squad to keep Cronulla guessing. Uh, but the team knew that I, I wasn't playing, you know. And, and it's funny. Then when he told me I wasn't playing, the next day my knee was sore. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'd kind of given up. I'd yeah. given up on the hope of playing. I thought, oh, bloody, my knees bloody sore. I started throbbing so again. It's crazy what the, what the yeah, mind is, the yeah, power does, of the mind. Know. It's the power of the mind. And then um, so the boys trained the rest of the week and then I, I rocked up the captain's run just in my tracksuit and he, I didn't train. And and as I was leaving captain's run, Madge just – he just yelled out. He was on the field. He goes, hey, he goes, because I was still part of the 19-man squad. Yeah. Because he wanted to keep Cronulla guessing up until full, um, – kickoff, an hour before kickoff. And he said, mate, he goes, just bring your boots tomorrow, like just in case, you know. I was like, oh, whatever. And I, I had my boots in my car for captain's run that day, even though I wasn't training. So I just left my bag in the car, you know. And I went home and um, my, my brother had flown down from Brizzy um, because, you know, even though I wasn't playing, it was my last game at Leichhardt, you know. And yeah. I was going to say farewell to the, the crowd and stuff. So my brother was down here and um, we got a feed the night before just at home went up the road and then come back to mine and we had a couple of glasses of scotch and sat, sat on my balcony and we had a chat and then he went home around oh, around 11.30 or midnight or something and, mate, I stayed up till 3 in the morning watching the cricket. The ashes were on and I stayed up watching the cricket and I went to bed and I thought, you know, I'll wake up the next day. I said, make sure you enjoy the day even though you're not playing. Um, you know, this yeah. time I get to say a proper farewell to the crowd. Yeah. Uh, it was a full house. So I got to the ground early and as I parked my car I thought, and my, my backpack was in the back seat, and I thought, oh, don't don't bring it, like whatever. And then, and then I, I literally I walked away from the car from the car for about ten meters, and I thought, no, you know what, I better just go get it in case. Went yeah. back, got my backpack, walked into the ground, put my back just through in the corner of the, the change rooms, and then was outside. And you know, Chris Hinton were there, and all these people were there, and it was just a, yeah, you know, everyone was, all the fans were saying bye to me and stuff, and I was just soaking in the atmosphere. I saw Paul Gallon before kickoff, and he's like, are you playing? I said, no, I'm not. You know, and uh, he, he's like, oh, mate, we thought you were playing. And I was just out there and then the boys came out to warm up. I was in my tracksuit and I was just passing some balls to Brooksy. And then next second, our, our assistant coach, Craig Sandercock, he, um, he's like, mate, he goes, Tubbsy's, he goes, Tubbsy's hurt. I was like, I said, I said, what? He goes, mate, he goes, get inside. He goes, Tubbsy's done his calf. And I, 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 thought, he was, I thought he was joking because I used to joke around with Sandy a lot, you know, and, and he's like, no, no, he goes, get inside. So without trying to make a scene, I just – just started jogging inside. I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And Tubbs is in there getting looked at by the medical staff and I start, my heart starts racing. And then yeah, they're like, mate, you might, you might playing. be playing, you might be. And then Madge comes in, he says, mate, get your boots on. He goes, he's going out for a last fitness test. He goes, if not, you're in. So I'm there and I'm just like, my head's just going 100 mile an hour. Trip him over as he walked out? Hey. Did you trip him over as he yeah. walked out? <laughs> <laughs> no, and then, um, 
and then Moses Envoy's in there mm. and Mo- Moses is great. It's like a scene from bloody Eight Mile or so. He's there and he's like, mate, this is meant to be. You're <laughs> going to win us a fucking game. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I was like, Moe, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up because I'm trying to calm myself <laughs> yeah. down. Like my, my emotions are already up here yeah. and I'm just trying to breathe, just going, all right, you've got a job to do. Yeah. Focus, you know, because I hadn't eaten breakfast. Have I'd had thought a couple of, of scotches the night before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But my adrenaline, I knew that I'd like, I knew I'd get get myself through, you know, and I was confident in my leg because I've played with injuries so many times, you know, like there's games I shouldn't have played and I've played with injuries. And I know, I know once I cross that white line that I'm 100% yeah. and I'd never let anybody down. You know, I've, I've played busted so many times and I knew mentally what it took. So, so I was ready to go, you know. Um, but then Madge, Madge um, obviously was, I, I, I wish he started me. You know, I look back now in hindsight and I was like, I wish he started me and just, because if I'd run out and started the game, I think the crowd and the energy, it just would have gone to the next level. And in the end, yeah. in the end, we, um, you know, we were a bit flat that day and, and Sharks skipped out to, a, you know, I think, 24-4 lead by the time I got on and the game was over. I got on with that 25 minutes to go but um, and we'd lost. And as I said, it was a, a movie with a shit ending. But yeah. um, but to, to look back now and to have that opportunity to play that yeah. last game in front of the crowd and just the way it happened, I think, I think no one will ever forget my last game. I know I definitely won't for sure. Yeah, but for um, sure. but just disappointing we lost because it would have been unbelievable to to go out and help uh, orchestrate a win for us and get us to the semi-finals. Even though, as I said, I, I wouldn't have been able to play the next week. But yeah, um, yeah it would have well, been. Well, knowing you, you would have played. But um, anyway, yeah, great to have you on, Robbie. Pleasure, Love mate. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. Nah, thanks, thanks, guys. Much. Appreciate Cheers, it. Cheers, mate. You're welcome, guys. Anytime. Awesome. And don't forget to subscribe. Standing Eight YouTube, Apple Podcast, and Spotify. <laughs>